Laura and their other collaborators, um, <coughs> in which they find that for CC manifolds, a large fraction of, uh, in fact, most of the CC3 manifolds, Clavia 3 folds, are elliptically fibered, um, perhaps not just once, but many times. So, oh, no, I'm not messing with this. Yeah. Great. And now if I hit this button, okay, we're doing great. Okay, so let me move into the actual talk and begin by reviewing a few things about Calabia threefolds. Again, much of this was covered in James's talk yesterday, but just to recapitulate a few of the main points. So for physicists, the reason we're interested in Calabia threefolds is because they solve the vacuum Einstein equations, which basically just comes from the fact that they're Ricci flat, and they from the, point, from the physics point of view, they preserve the <coughs> symmetry, which comes from the fact that there is a complex structure, um, this is, it is a Kähler structure, uh, that is, in the physics language, something that guarantees supersymmetry in a variety of constructions. <coughs> Mathematically, of course, uh, the characteristic feature is that the canonical class is trivial up to torsion. And as many of us here in this room have, have been thinking about, and some of us for longer than others, um, Claudia manifolds have been studied ever since the uh, first ideas came into math and physics. Yao and others uh, started looking at these <coughs> decades ago. And they're used in many different compactifications of string theory. Heterotic string theory taking us down to four dimensions, type two. F theory on a Claudia threefold takes us down to six dimensions. Uh, M theory goes down to five dimensions. And there are many classes of Calabi yau manifolds known. The largest one, I believe, is this set of uh, hypersurface, toric hypersurface Calabi yau threefolds that were classified by Kreutzer and Skarka in terms of reflexive 4D polytopes, and there's about 400 million of those. And those are the main ones I'll be talking about today. Um, there are also the CCs, which uh, James talked about yesterday, and the generalized CCs, which, which Laura and and James and their collaborators have developed, which is a much broader class uh, using the same general principles as CCs. But there, there remains this open question. Are there a finite number or an infinite number of topologically distinct types of Calabia threefolds? Uh, and hopefully what I say today will we'll begin to, to have some uh, <coughs> on the answer to that question. You so know, I, I asked this question 40, 35 years ago. Excellent. Well, I think it may be less than 35 years before the answer comes. I think we, we may be moving towards it, but we may not be. Let's see how, how far we can get. Um, it's a great question. So let me say a couple things about elliptic and genus 1 fibered Calabia threefolds. These are basically Calabia threefolds, uh, which are fibered over a base B2. There's a projection pi from the threefold to the base. And the inverse of that at a generic point is a T2. If there's a global section, then it's elliptic. And if it's elliptic, then there's a Weierstrass model. We've seen this in a few talks yesterday. Weierstrass form where f and g are sections of O of minus 4k and O of minus 6k. So there's a, a theorem by Gross, following on some work uh, by Antonella here, um, that proves that there are a finite number of topological types of elliptic and genus 1 Calabia threefolds. One can see this more constructively uh, using language that basically comes from f theory. All the bases, uh, as Antonella proved years ago, are blow-ups of the Hirzelbrook surfaces, or P2, or this exotic case here, uh, Enriquez, which is also connected with one. It's nice. That, that does not have very many uh, cases, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, the bases are basically blow-ups of the Hirzelbrooks, and that means that we can characterize each topological type as a Weierstrass model with certain um, algebraic conditions on the coefficients, and by the Hilbert basis theorem, there are a finite number of distinct strata in the space of Weierstrass models over each of those finite bases. Therefore, that's a constructive way of thinking about making a list of all the uh, colliptic Calabia manifolds. And in work over the last uh, five, six years, um, we've developed technology largely based on this idea of F theory um, that, in principle, allows us to essentially construct. All the, Calabi, all the elliptic Calabias. The idea is first we classify the allowed bases, the B2s. If we restrict to toric bases, there are only about 65,000 of those. Um, I should mention that I'm avoiding uh, co-dimension 2, 4, 6 points, the SCFTs that Jonathan talked about yesterday. Um, and there's a lot of interesting and rich structure. Jim and, and Cody over at Northeastern have been studying threefolds and fourfolds with SCFTs. You get a lot more of them, but I'm focusing here on bases that give elliptic vibrations without those. Um, 
for six points. The toric bases we classified with Dave Morrison, and even non-toric bases, by keeping track of the combinatorial data of the base, we can basically make a list. There are some technical issues that uh, arise at lower Hodge numbers, but, but this, in principle, gives us a way of classifying at least all the Calabia threefolds that are elliptically fiber to large Hodge number. We first classify the bases, and then we tune the virus cross models to get bigger gauge groups, bigger codiron singularity types. So in principle, this gives us a, a procedure for constructing the elliptic Calabiaus. And the thing I'm going to emphasize today is this growing evidence that most known Calabiao threefolds are either elliptic or genus 1 fiber. I'm thinking of elliptic as a special case of genus 1 fiber. And uh, various aspects of this have been studied. Uh, James talked a lot about this yesterday. Um, they've been looking at the, at the CCs. Um, at the, in terms of kreutzer skarka Candelis, Constantine, and Skarka years ago looked at uh, K3 fibrations and found that a large fraction were K3 fiber. So my goal today is to dig a bit more deeply into this, explicitly exp explore this uh, kreutzer skarka database, and first of all, directly analyze the fiber structure to see which ones really are elliptically fibered. Second, uh, construct simple fibrations and sort of sieve those out and see what's left and how the other cases can be more exotic types of fibrations. And finally, uh, this, this other thing I mentioned, which um, is fairly new, and then is a paper that hopefully will be coming out with Yu Chen in, a, in the next week or two, or a few weeks at least, uh, about mirror symmetry, which seems to factorize in many cases. In particular, we find that most of these Calabia threefolds in the, in the kreutzer skarka database are elliptic, and for those that are elliptic, in many cases, the mirror symmetry factorizes between the base and the fiber. So I'll try to talk about all three of these things. Stop briefly for questions before I... Yes? So do you suggest that the mirror of elliptic Calabial 3 is also elliptic Calabial? In most... I believe in many cases it is. There are certainly counterexamples. I mean, the mirror of the quintic is... The quintic is not elliptically fibered, and its mirror is. But surprisingly many of the things in the kreutzer skarka database exhibit a structure where the battery of mirror symmetry naturally factorizes. And I'll, I'll show you that in more detail. There is old work by Per and uh, Per Berger, and uh, his collaborator, historic collaborators, uh -huh. uh, about uh, mirror. And, uh, but they don't focus on the elliptic cases. But if right, you, so there's something special yeah, about the elliptic cases. Yeah, I, I, if you look through it, yeah. I should look at that work. So yeah. you, maybe we can talk about that yeah, offline. Definitely. But the thing that I'm bringing in here, which I think, I mean, this is fairly new. Meyer, we just found Meyer. this in the last few weeks. Yeah. It's possible that someone in the past has run across this, and we are not aware of it. So if somebody, if anyone in the audience knows about this, please let me know. This also connects to work that, that Paul Oman and, and collaborators did um, on the fibers. But I'll, I'll come to that later in the talk. So that's the, that's the third part of the talk. Um, first of all, let me just briefly uh, remind everyone, or, or give a quick... Uh, heuristic introduction to the, the language of toric varieties that we're going to be using. Uh, and this idea of constructing Calabiao threefolds as hypersurfaces in toric varieties was developed by through the methods of Baderev and then systematically implemented by Kreutzer and Skarka. Um, and the idea is we're going to use toric geometry, which is sort of a, uh, you know, a simple man's, simple person's version of uh, algebraic geometry, where you do everything using simple combinatorial um, structures. So, P2, for instance, complex projective two-dimensional space, is characterized by this fan, which basically has some rays representing the toric divisors, which are the three x equals zero, y equals zero, z equals zero divisors in the regular homogeneous coordinates on P2. Um, so each ray in this kind of picture represents a divisor. There are equivalences under uh, addition along the d axes and d dimensions, uh, which give us a Stanley Reisner ideal that we mod out by to get the independent uh, divisors. If we want to blow up a point, for example, in P2, we do that by simply adding a new ray. Uh, this new ray now represents a minus one curve connecting to zero curves, and uh, this would be Hertzbrook surface, Del Pezzo one or Hertzbrook one. Um, so in general, a toric variety will be characterized by these toric divisors, di, which are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the rays, the one-dimensional cones in this, in this fan, to use the toric language. Really, all we need to know here is that there are a set of favored divisors, di, associated with these rays, di, uh, that live in a d-dimensional lattice. 
the anti-canonical class of the toric variety is just the sum of the toric divisors. So from this, we immediately see that we don't have ever a compact collabial because a toric variety will, a compact toric variety will always have at least one ray, and so the anti-canonical class will never vanish. But if we take a <coughs> hypersurface in the anti-canonical class, then the adjunction formula immediately tells us that that hypersurface is itself collabial. So uh, the framework for discussing collabials in this context is, is conveniently discussed in the, language as a, in the language of polytopes. So we can think of a polytope, uh, I'll call it the Nabla polytope, um, as the convex hull of the set of rays, VI and the toric variety. And the set of monomials in the anti-canonical hypersurface correspond to lattice points in the dual polytope, which are defined by the set of uh, points which, whose inner product with all the rays V um, is greater than or equal to minus 1. Sorry, that's supposed to say W is in uh, ZD star. So Fadarev showed that if the dual polytope is a lattice polytope, then this polytope nabla is reflexive, meaning that nabla equals nabla star star, which is equivalent to the condition that it has a single interior point. And when this is the case, then the hypersurface Calabiao is generically smooth, will avoid the singularities, and gives us a, a Calabiao hypersurface in this toric variety. So that's the context in which we're going to be uh, discussing things. So there are some situations where when we have, say, a, a Calabiao threefold that's realized through a toric hypersurface, we can immediately see that it is elliptically fibered. And this occurs when we have a simple toric vibration, that is when there is a two-dimensional reflexive polytope, which is a sub-polytope of the four-dimensional reflexive polytope, where the two-dimensional reflexive polytope passes through the origin. And there's a short list of reflexive 2D polytopes. You can just write it down with a little bit of work. Um, these have been used in the F-theory context by, by Volker Brown, Brown, Grant Pritel, and this, this group, uh, including Paul and others, uh, looking at aspects of the vibration structure when we use these two-dimensional reflexive polytopes as slices of the four-dimensional reflexive polytopes. So there's 16 of these. I won't be using all of them, but basically we have like F1, which is just, this is just P2. So again, the, the rays here living in this are the rays that we use to define P2. This is P1 cross P1. This is the Hertzbrook surface um, F1. This is the Hertzbrook surface F2. This is the thing we got a minute ago by blowing up um, the, the P2. This is the Hertzbrook surface F2. F10 here is an important one. This is the Hertzbrook surface P231. Uh, this here is the dual of F1. So we can ask when we have a genus 1 vibration like this, that is, over each point in the base. So when we have a slice like this, delta 2, nabla 2 is a sub-polytope of nabla, it means there's a projection which projects nabla 2 to 0. And that projection will project onto some base, a toric base. Um, and we can ask, when does, so that gives an electric vibration, because an anti-canonical hypersurface in a reflexive 2 polytope is just an elliptic curve. So we have now an elliptic, uh, an elliptic curve over every point, but we can ask when is there a global section? So there's a global section, basically if there's a minus one curve in this fiber. So we can check that basically a minus one curve satisfies minus k dot c is c dot c plus two is one. And all of these 16 polytopes except for the three here, F1, F2, and F4, have minus one curves. Basically, all of them can be reached by blowing up one of these basic surfaces. These are factor, this is related to um, Nella's observation. Um, okay, so all of these except these three have toric sections, and therefore, if we have a vibration by anything except F1, F2, and F4, then it's actually an elliptic vibration and not just genus one. Okay, so, what, what do we want to do? So what Yuchin and I have been doing is taking the elements of the kreutzer skarka database and asking, well, which ones are elliptically fibered? So the first thing I want to describe is in the second paper we wrote, which just came out a week or two ago, which is 
to just look at the things in the Kreutzer Square Hockey database and directly identify when there is an elliptic fiber living in uh, this thing in an obvious way that we can identify by a subpolytope, a two dimensional subpolytope. This is somewhat like what James was describing last night, where in some cases with the complete intersections, you can immediately read off that there is an elliptic fibration. In other cases, you have to work harder. These are the obvious ones. It's not all the elliptic fibrations, but it's just the ones that are manifest. So there's a simple algorithm, which um, is really a, 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 just a, a more, a, 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 an algorithm that, that Volker Brown used at, in a paper years ago to uh, look at all things which projected onto P2. We've got some algorithmic efficiencies to make this a little bit more effective. Basically, the idea is we look at all the pairs of rays in the four-dimensional polytope nabla, and we look at the span of those, which intersects with this to give some nabla 2. And when that is a reflexive two-polytope, then we know that there's an elliptic fibration. We use a little bit of algorithmic efficiency to make this faster. In particular, uh, we limit the set of V and W in a, in, a, in a simple way by using the maximum inner product that those things could have with something in the dual to make this a little speedier. Um, currently, this is in Mathematica. We're actually working with Anuj, who's here now, to um, do this more generally. So we haven't done this for the whole database, but we're hoping that with a more efficient implementation, we can. Um, but basically, the idea is we're going to find cases in the Kreutzer Square database where one of these FIs uh, is a fiber, which means that we have either a genus 1 or elliptic fibration. If we have only fibrations by F1, 2, and 4, it means we have a genus 1 fibration and there's not necessarily a section, although there might be a non toric section. Any other FI means that we have an elliptic fibration, a manifest elliptic fibration. <coughs> Questions about any of that? Okay, so here's the first result, which is looking at the set of polytopes which give Calabi-Yaus with Hodge numbers where 1 of H11 or H21 is bigger than or equal to 140, there are only 4 out of 500,000 or so polytopes that lack any genus 1, any manifest genus 1 fiber. Everything else is just obviously fiber. The four counterexamples, two of them have H11 equals 1, so we know right off the bat that those can't be elliptically fibered by Shiota tape Lazier. Um, and then there are these two cases, 7, 143, and 146, 62. I mean, the reason we started at 140 is because we kept going down until we found some examples that weren't elliptically fibered. It wasn't just an accident that we tried 140 and happened to hit it spot on. We just kept going until we got to the point where we had some counterexamples. Um, now, these two here may well still have elliptic vibrations. Uh, James talked yesterday about methods that he and Laura have been using to actually look at the triple intersection structure and and compute when there is a, a vibration. It's quite possible that these have fibers. Out at H11 equals 140, that's a difficult calculation, so we haven't done that yet. But at least at this point, we can say that everything, all the gray dots here, represent polytopes that have toric elliptic vibrations that are manifest in the database. So it's very common to have elliptic fibers at large Hodge numbers. And you're just identifying this based on these, these two-dimensional polytopes that do or do not have an elliptic vibration versus genus 1 vibration? Exactly. Okay. We are just, we're just we're taking each of these 500,040 polytopes and saying, right. can we find a pair of rays that gives us a sub-polytope nabla 2? Right. And if any of them are giving us F, any F other than F1, 2, and 4, we know yeah, it's elliptic. elliptic. And if it's just F1, 2, and 4, we know it's at least genus 1, if not elliptic. And if we can't find anything, then we don't know. Now, these two we know are not elliptically fibered. These two may be elliptically fibered. We just know that those are the first cases that are not obviously elliptically fibered. So all but 384 of the kreutzer scarcker database uh, give rise to elliptically fibered hypersurfaces. Uh, when you restrict to H11 bigger than, or H1, H21 oh, bigger than or equal to 140. With, with okay. Anuj, we're now working on trying to do it for the whole database. Yes. OK. Um, now, another thing we looked at is what happens at small H11. So interestingly, the probability empirically that a Clavier threefold is not genus 1 or elliptically fiber decreases exponentially as the Hodge numbers go up as H11 goes up. So here's the data. Basically, at H11 equals 2, 64% of them are not elliptically fiber. At H11 equals 3, 37% are not. At 4, 21%, 10%, 5%, 2%. So the probability that you are not elliptically fibered is going down exponentially. Here's the, the red, the curve, this is a <coughs> of the red dots, which give us the probability on this axis that there is no fiber in the polytope. The blue dots 
far, this is measured in units of 10 million, so this is 35 million, the number of polytopes in the database with a given H11. And if we assume that this formula, 2 to the minus H11, basically 0 0.1 times 2 to the 5 minus H11, which is the, an empirical fit to these data points here, if we assume that's followed, then the fraction uh, gives us an expected polytope number that is, is elliptically, that is not elliptically fibered, that peaks around H11 equals 9, and then goes down again. So we haven't looked at all of them, but this empirical data so far suggests that. Now, why is it, why would we imagine that it's exponentially unlikely to not have a fiber as we go up? So, so uh, James had the same theorem uh, yesterday on his, on his slides, this theorem uh, uh, that was proven by Aguiso and Wilson. It was conjectured by Collar in various dimensions that there's a condition for a... Collar conjectured it later. Good. Yes, thank you. They proved it in three dimensions. Collar conjectured it in other dimensions, yeah. right? Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, so if Claudia has refold is genus 1 or elliptically fibered, if and only if there's a divisor that satisfies d cubed equals 0, d squared dot equals 0, and d dot c is positive for everything, and non-negative for everything in the uh, effective tone of curves. So this d cubed equals 0 in some sense is really the hard condition. It's, it's uh, most likely you will have d squared not equal to 0. That would be like a K3 fibered case or something if that was equal to 0. So why is it very unlikely that you don't satisfy that condition? So let me just ask the following question. If we just assume sort of random data for the triple intersection form, how likely is it that we will satisfy this condition that there's an elliptic fiber? So there are two possible obstructions. One possible obstruction is number theoretic. That is, there may be no solution to the cubic form in however many variables over the integers. The other thing is there might be a cone obstruction. There might be no solution over the reals when we can restrict to D in the positive cone. For example, if all the C's are positive, then if the cone says that all the D's have to be positive, then there's no way to get this equal to zero. But let's continue to consider these two possible obstructions. So let me clarify what I mean by a number theoretic obstruction. For example, if we take this cubic form in four variables, x cubed, x, y, x squared, y, y cubed, 2z cubed, plus 4, w cubed, this has no solutions over the integers. And it's easy to check that. Basically, if everything's even, since this is homogeneous, we can divide it by 2. So there has to be a solution where something is odd. But if, say, x is odd, and y is even, then the whole thing is odd, so it can't vanish. So that means if x is odd, then y has to be odd, but then this is odd, so that still won't work. So x can't be odd. Similarly, y can't be odd. And so if x and y are even, then z, if z is odd, then this is congruent to 2 mod 4, that won't work. And if w is odd, then z is even, it'll be congruent to 4 mod 8, that won't work, so can't do it. Okay, so in 1937, Wardell identified homogeneous degree d polynomials in d squared variables that have such a, an obstruction, a number theoretic obstruction. And then there was a conjecture by the mathematicians that uh, d squared might be the maximum number of variables with an obstruction. This has been proven for d equals 1 and 2. There's a counterexample for 17 variables in a quartic. Um, for cubics, which is our important case, it was shown by Heath Brown that every non-singular cubic in at least 10 variables with rational coefficients has a non-trivial rational zero. And if you relax the condition that it's non-singular and just do it for a general cubic, that's been proven for at least 16 variables. So the upshot of this is, if H11 is bigger than 15, and probably bigger than 9, which remember is where we peaked, uh, there's no possible number theoretic obstruction to this thing being solved. So we can't avoid having an elliptic vibration for number theoretic reasons when H11 is bigger than likely 10, at least 15. Okay. The other possibility is this cone obstruction. And just from a very simple heuristic and non-rigorous mathematical point of view, physicist's argument, um, you can argue that if the coefficients of the thing are essentially random, then there's an exponential suppression to cone obstructions. So the basic idea is let's proceed by induction. Assume we have two variables. We have a cubic in two variables. It's got at least one real solution. So let's take the one real solution. There's a 50%. If we put x in, say, d1 in the positive cone, if we assume that our cone condition is that all the d's have to have non-negative coefficients, if we choose d1 to be positive, we solve for d2, there's a 50% chance that it'll be in the cone. So there may be a 50-50 chance that there's an obstruction here at, at worst. If we add a variable, then 
we can check the first condition for two variables. If that doesn't work, we pick random numbers in the cone of the first two and check for the third. And again, there's a one-half chance that we will be in the wrong part of the cone. So the probability that we don't have an, a vibration or a solution to this cubic in the positive cone basically has an upper bound of 2 to the minus h11. So it's kind of heuristic, but it matches the data. So it suggests that basically that the cone structure has to be extremely finely tuned, and the, and the triple intersection numbers have to be very finely tuned to avoid having an elliptic vibration. And bottom line is that's what we see uh, in the data, that we, ex we get this exponential decrease. Okay, so I would say at this point that there is strong evidence that almost all known Calabi-Yau threefolds have some genus 1 or elliptic vibration. Again, this is supported by the work of, of Lauren and James and collaborators. Uh, for instance, they showed uh, in a recent paper with Hammock that all CC threefolds that have H11 bigger than 4 have genus 1 or elliptic fibers. So, looks like things are very elliptically fibered. And if most Calabi-Yau threefolds are elliptic or genus 1 fibered, and the number of elliptic or genus 1 fiber Calabi-Yau threefolds is limited to a finite number of topological types, that would prove a finite number of Calabi-Yau threefolds. So all we need to do is prove that it is in fact the case that most Calabi-Yau threefolds are elliptic or genus 1 fiber, and we would be done. It would be hopefully less than 35 more years. For, so, yeah. so this makes it seem as though the non fibered threefolds are in some sense special cases. Now we know that all the elliptic and genus 1 Calabia, or at least all the elliptic Calabia threefolds are connected by various kinds of extremal transitions. And we can actually see this from the F-theory language, that the bases are all blow-ups of the Hertzbrooks. The Hertzbrooks are all connected by blow-ups and blow-downs, and all the other ones are connected by tunings of the generic elliptic vibration over the blown-up bases. And th those are all connections through extremal transitions. So at least for elliptic Calabi-Yau's, um, it seems like Reed's fantasy is realized, and so all we really need to do is take what looks like a small fraction of special cases, find ways of connecting them, and we would have completed Reed's fantasy. Okay. Um, let me say a few words about the structure of the vibrations, which we've investigated in further detail. And this was actually in the first paper with Yu Chen, which is much more uh, technical in detail um, and is a little bit more complicated. But uh, the idea is to, uh, is to understand what kinds of structure we get for these elliptic vibrations. Um, so the first point I want to make is that there's a very close connection between the so-called tape form. Now, this is, of course... For mathematicians, this is just the general Weierstrass form that you use when you don't know what your characteristic is or something. Uh, mathematicians, physicists have taken to calling this the Tate form because you can use this through the Tate algorithm to tune certain kinds of Kodaira singularity types. Uh, so there's a close connection between this general form of the Weierstrass model with the coefficients a1, a2, a3, a4, and a6, which are sections of minus nk, um, and a very simple kind of simple stacking fibered polytope. Basically, and this is a generalization of a class of polytopes that, that Kreutzer, Skarka, and others have used for many years. The idea is if we take our P231 fiber, right, which has vertices 1, 0, 0, 1, and minus 2, minus 3 in the last two columns, and then we stack over the minus 2, minus 3 point a toric base, where we take each of the rays of the toric base and, and add a vector like that, then from the geometry, the dual polytope, the, the delta associated with Nabla star, represents precisely the set of monomials in the tape form. A1, A2, A3, A4, and A6 represent the set of points in the dual polytope. And this connects mostly to this so-called top construction that Candelas and others have used from it, and, and, and many people in the, in the uh, F theory and, and earlier uh, Calabiao um, endeavors have used from the physics point of view. There are some subtleties here when you have non take non hexable or tuned gauge groups as to some extra structure that arises there. But this is a very simple class of obviously manifestly fibered polytope, where the polytope basically has this form where some of the vertices are the vertices of the base stacked over the minus two minus three point, as we depict here, and then we have the other vertices of the of the fiber, stacked over the vertices of the fiber. Um, and it turns out that these constructions of this simple vibration type, which match precisely with tape form, 
dominate at large Hodge numbers. Um, and part of the reason that this, I think, turns out is that, uh, as we discussed in this paper, if you try to use other fiber types, they don't really work over the minus 12 curve. Um, the minus 12 curve supports a non hanksville E8. And uh, it, it can only be realized when you have a minus 6K, this A6 is minus, as a section of minus 6K. And the other fibers don't admit such high sections. Uh, they're all combinations of monomials which have different sections of minus NK. And only this one has a minus 6K, which allows the minus 12 curve. There are, are, in fact, other polytopes at large Hodge numbers which don't have this form, but many of them do. So what we did was we systematically implemented tape forms on toric bases. In other words, forget about the database. Let's just take the all toric bases that we've already made a list of, do tape tuning over them, and look at what we get. And it turns out that all but 18 of the Hodge number pairs with large values of H11 or H21 are realized directly in this fashion. And the other examples give us some interesting new idea of how elliptic vibration structure can work. We found through this, there's actually an exotic tape tuning that gives the uh, triple anti-symmetric um, matter of uh, S of SU6, which hadn't been appreciated before. There are some very large tunings where the base has a generic elliptic vibration with H11 equals, say, 135, that gets pushed up. Some of them have automatic U1s. Some of them have a construction which can realize gauge groups on non-toric curves. A lot of interesting structure. You can look at the paper. Um, we also looked at cases with many fibers, which is something that James talked about yesterday. Some of the polytopes have a lot of different vibrations. I want to get to the mirror symmetry story, so I'm not going to say too much about this. But um, basically, the ones with the most vibrations occur at small H21 and large H11. And I'll say something more about that when we get to the numbers. Um, this is maybe related to the fact that these are the dominant collabiaos that you get when you just do a random sequence of blow-ups. OK, uh, I promised something about mirror symmetry, so let me, let me uh, spend the last five, eight, eight minutes um, saying something about mirror symmetry. So we found that, at least at large Hodge numbers, and, and plausibly for the whole database, almost all these toric hypersurface collabia threefolds admit manifest elliptic vibrations. Now, in many of those cases, the manifest elliptic vibration immediately gives us a way of understanding the mirror symmetry through a factorized structure. The idea is, if we have a fiber, NABLA2, which is a slice of NABLA, if the dual fiber, that is delta 2, is also a slice of the dual polytope, then we have mirror symmetry, which, so I, I, I didn't mention this, but NABLA and delta describe a mirror pair of Calabia threefolds. So if, delta two, if NABLA 2 is a slice of NABLA and there's a dual delta 2, which is also a slice of delta, then the mirror symmetry factorizes. And many of the things in the gross experiment database seem to satisfy this. So the sim let me give you the, the idea of the simplest kind of situation. I described these sort of simple stackings where we take P231 and we put a base over, this is this picture here where we stack, we have polytopes of this form. We have these vertices and then over this vertex of the fiber we stack the base. Anytime we start with a polytope like that, the mirror polytope will essentially have the form that the fiber is still P231, because the mirror of 2P231 is P231, and the base is now the base we get by considering the fan constructed from all the rays that are primitive vectors living within the polytope formed by minus 6KB in the dual lattice. I'll have a picture in a second. And so right off the bat, this is, there's like 65,000 examples of this. For every generic elliptic vibration over a toric base, there's an immediate factorization of the mirror symmetry where we can just take the mirror of the base. So here's an example. Let's take the generic elliptic vibration on P2. This has Hodge numbers 2, 2, 72. And we can understand these Hodge numbers from an F-theory point of view by thinking about uh, the H11 of the total space through Shio to Tate Wazir as the H11 of the base plus the rank of the gauge group plus one for the fiber. That's two in this case. The mirror of the generic elliptic vibration over P2 is the generic elliptic vibration over this big toric fan. It's the, this is the set of rays which satisfy W dot V greater than or equal to minus 6, where W is primitive, and that inner product has to be more than, bigger than or equal to minus 6 for all the rays in the original base. So this is the algorithm to do mirror symmetry for a P231 vibration. You just take the base, and for, in the toric case, you do this. Now, 
There's an interesting question, which is, can one generalize this beyond toric? And I think the answer to that may be yes, and it might be interesting to discuss that with people. But it's manifest how to do it in the toric case. And so now we can ask, OK, how do we get the Hodge numbers 272, 2 out of this big mess? And so if you look at this, these rays, we can read off from the ray structure here what the gauge group is. And these rays here, the ones in red, correspond to minus 12 curves, and they carry on non hexable E8 gauge groups. So this is basically a recurring pattern of E8s, F4s, and G2 cross SU2s, which is associated with these lines at distance 6 from the origin. It's related to these uh, constructions from the building blocks that Jonathan mentioned yesterday, where you get this natural sequence, uh, minus 12, minus 1, minus 2, minus 2, minus 3, etc., which gives you an E8. So blue, the green, the reds are E8s, there's nine of those. The blues are F4s, there's nine of those, those are minus um, five curves. The G2 cross SU2 factors are the, these uh, purple ones and the green ones, which are minus three, minus two curves next to each other. Uh, that's from the not minus three, minus two, minus two non hexable cluster that gives you G2 cross SU2. <coughs> anyway, you take this messy gauge group, and the rank of that plus H11 of B, which is 109, there are minus 11 curves actually on the corners, which require three extra blow ups. You do the counting carefully, you get 272. So, H11 of this, based on the structure of this gauge group and also just directly from the toric analysis, is 272. So, this is an example of a factorization of mirror symmetry. This goes to this. Here's another example. Remember. Can you um, say a little bit more about the, uh, the structure of the intersection form for the gauge group? So, for example, you have seven brains wrapping the various curves. What, what do they? What does the actual adjacency matrix look like? So the the sequence is minus eleven double slash minus twelve minus twelve minus twelve minus eleven times three, and the slash slash is minus one minus two minus two minus three minus one minus five minus one minus three minus two minus two. Minus one. It's the thing that we've, we and you have all run into many times. Well, but this is just like some one-dimensional thing? I would have thought there might For be... For any Toric fan, it's always a loop. Okay, so this is a loop. Yes, it's, okay. it's just a loop. I mean, if, if the base is Toric, yeah. then it's just a loop of these things. There are, minus, there are three minus 11 curves, and they have one more point, which actually to make it smooth has to be blown out. So it's not exact. It's a loop with three little things hanging off it on the minus 11 curves. I assume it's Z3 symmetric, or? It is Z3 symmetric, just like P2 was. Yeah. 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 OK. So, so this is uh, 272. Here's another example. This is the, so you remember the, the Hodge diamond thing has the shape. The, the Hodge numbers look like this <laughs> here, which has Hodge numbers 251, 251. <laughs> This is another example. The generic elliptic vibration over this base is self mirrored <coughs> And this base, we do the same kind of analysis, and now we have a zero curve here. We have a minus, we have a plus six curve here, and then we have a minus 12 curve, and then one run of minus 12 curves, one of those sequences here, this sequence of minus 12, and then we have a minus 11 at the corner. And then we have a sequence of seven minus 12 curves running along there. And we again, we do the analysis. This gauge group has these factors, like this, these groups, rank 152. We add that to the H11, which has one extra blow up from the minus 11 curve, and we get 251. So this is the explicit mirror factorization of mirror symmetry for the 251-251 polytope. It's a generic elliptic vibration over this space. And this base, you'll notice, has the property that each of the vertices dotted into each of the other vertices is minus 6. So this is self-mirror under the base goes to the minus 6k mirror operation. OK, so we can play this game, and we can generalize it in lots of ways. I'll just touch on some of what we can do, because I'm running out of time. And uh, we're also just running out of time. What's that? I thought I had 45 minutes. Uh, but we studied that. Okay. Great. Well, I'll, I'll talk more slowly then. Thank you. <laughs> What's that? So the, the models you're talking about, they have more than one genus one vibration? Um, some of the, many of them do. Well, you're writing down these closed loops, so that's the natural candidate for another elliptic curve. Sorry. Or genus so, so the polytopes may have multiple elliptic vibrations, but they may be over different bases. Sure. So for, for example, um, since the boy was hoping I have extra time, um, there's a really interesting case, which is if we take, so I just showed you what happens on the midpoint here. If we take this one here, 
Right. That one up there is a generic elliptic vibration over F12. Okay. So the mirror here, this is uh, 491.11. This, it turns out, has two elliptic vibrations, two manifest elliptic vibrations. One of them is the generic elliptic vibration over the B tilde, which is like minus 6K of this thing. And then this is, you know, the mirror of this, which is some great big thing like this, and it just barely, you know, has, has the minus 6 comma 1, minus 6, minus 6, and you know, some very large number <coughs> of minus 6. And this is the mirror polytope, and you've got lots of VAs and stuff. Interestingly, there's a second vibration here where the base only has minus 4 curves and nothing above. And we don't understand why that is, but it's a totally different elliptic vibration. The base has a totally different intersection structure, and it doesn't have anything of self-intersection below minus 4. Is this addressing your question? So this is a polytope which has multiple elliptic vibrations by this analysis, and the bases are totally different. And I, I don't understand why this thing, which is way the heck out here, should have a base which has just minus 4 and then a different fiber structure. This is one of the things we'd like to understand better. But they also have different fibers. What's that? So the yes, absolutely. This is not a P231 fiber. Do you remember each channel which fiber that is? F13. F13. Okay, there you go. This has F13 and F10. So there's some other weird structure going on there which suggests, in fact, there's lots of F13s, right? Way out at large H11. Is that right, Yuchen? I think at large H11 they have lots of cases. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one with a lot of I think that's there. the only one which other than F10 can extend to very large H21. That's right, and, and we don't understand quite what. Maybe Paul might have some insight into what's special about F13. We can talk offline. Yeah, Laura, you have a question? Sorry, I think you, you may have partially answered this, but Jonathan's question just raised a question for me, which is, if you have multiple vibrations, Yes. is your claim that this factorization of mirror symmetry across fiber and base should work for all of those vibrations? For so some of them. So, so I mean, will you always so imagine that you have two, and they both, it's about fact that your claim would be that in the mirror, you have to have the same set of, of multiple vibrations in that mirror. Is that so not all, I, can, I, can, I haven't put it on the slides, but I can very briefly say what the actual criteria is. And basically, well, I did, sorry, I did say what the criteria is, but I can restate it in a way that may be helpful. Let's say we have, say, P231 here, right? There's a projection onto some base on the two orthogonal coordinates, right? If all the rays, if the whole polytope, so the fact that there's a projection means that we can, there's some mapping pi, which takes everything here to zero. If this can also be viewed as a projection that onto the P231, so, so if there's a projection here to base, this corresponds in the dual polytope to a projection to delta 2. So in other words, in the dual polytope, all the monomials lie over these things. Nothing can go outside in this two-dimensional space outside that region. Similarly, if there's a slice here, meaning that there's a projection to another base here, that's true if and only if there's a projection to nabla 2. So if all the rays of the polytope in some coordinate <coughs> system lie over this P231, then we have a nice mirror. Now, in cases like, for instance, um, 1011, which is elliptically fibered, this is not true. And that means that, that the mirror is not elliptically fibered in a, in a factorized sense. So there can be cases where, I believe, there's a polytope which has, in fact, you, know, you chance looked at some of these examples, where there's a polytope that has multiple vibrations. One of the vibrations does have a nice mirror symmetry, but the other ones don't. So, uh, that's true, actually, I think, of this uh, F12 example, right, you chant? Uh, or P2, the P2 example, because the, the, the mirror P2, you were finding like 15 vibrations, right? Okay, so one side, there are more slices, but it's not like always we can um, put them in the same you know, factorize. Or it's like base rays would have to come from not just minus 6K, B. Right, so basically you might have a situation where there are base rays that stack over these things, and, and there's no, trans, no transformation that will put them all over there. So, so it's not the case that every manifest elliptic vibration exhibits this, this mirror symmetry factorization, but many of them do. Like the stacked one, like if we have base. Yeah, the, the simplest ones are the stacked ones, where, where we put everything over one point in the fiber. And so uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. So, so 
uh, before we go to that, you know, here we talked about the generic elliptic vibration over the toric basis. Pretty much any <coughs> tuned elliptic vibration over the toric basis will also have this property because they're still stacked in the same way. And these are the ones that we used with Yuchen to try to investigate the large Hodge numbers and where we found all Hodge numbers except for 18 uh, above 240. All of those fit in this class where the mirror symmetry will be explicit in the, in the slice of, of the vibration. So for large Hodge numbers, they're all of this simple form. Uh, the tuning will get us a lot of them, but it also works for other fibers and bundle structures. So for instance, let's say we take fiber F2, which looks like this, it's P1 cross P1, and we do a similar stacking thing, is what Yushan was referring to, where we pile the base up over this point here. Then in the dual, the monomials are sections of minus 0k here, minus 1k here, and minus 2k here. That means that there's a projection here onto a base which is defined by minus 2kb. So this, this is a case where the Hodge numbers are 494, the base is, F2, is P2, the fiber is F2, the mirror now has this fiber, and generically for a stacking of this type over, F, over a vertex of F2, the mirror will now have a base which is not minus 6k, but minus 2k, so it's a much simpler thing. Right, and this just has like minus three. This is like the other one I said, but it's got minus three, minus four, minus four, minus three, minus four, minus four, minus three, minus four, minus four, connected by minus ones in, in the language that John was talking about yesterday. Um, so we can we can also for these things immediately construct the factorization into the fiber and the base. And here's where I want to mention that uh, Paul it covers my Pena, Ullman, Paragua, and Reuter uh, looked carefully at these fibers and, and have studied to some extent this mirror symmetry at the level of the fibers. And what we're doing here is showing that actually it breaks into a factorization of the mirror symmetry where you can include the base structure. Okay, I'm definitely running out of time, but let me just point out that you can do the same thing for four folds. Same story. This base could be a three-fold. So for instance, if we take P3 and we do the standard stacking in this same way, then the rays in B tilde are just <coughs> primitive lattice points in a tetrahedron now, so a much more complicated version of this thing, which is now three-dimensional. A tetrahedron with vertices here, and the gauge group is EA to the 34, F4 to the 96, G2 to the 256, SU2 to the 384. And because the base is a threefold, there are a, a, an exponentially large number of ways of triangulating this thing. And this, I think, ties in, Jim, to some of the things that Jim and Cody and we with Yunnan Wang have been looking at in terms of threefold bases. This base has exponentially many triangulations, and it's also a base which gives an elliptic vibration without four six codimension two points that we noted in an earlier paper with Yinan Wang is a very common endpoint if you start with a random base like P3 and blow it up with a random sequence of blow ups until you can't blow up anymore after you go through all the four six codimension two low Anyway, I'm definitely over time now, but. Um, yeah, but two minutes. OK, great. Uh, so lots of further things to do. Analyzing the full chaos database, which, as I mentioned, we're doing now with Anjuch and, and, and Yuchen. Um, getting into more detail about the genus 1 and multi-section structure at small h11 for these other fibers, I think is an interesting question. Uh, similar analysis for CY four folds. Understanding the structure of the effective cone and triple intersection numbers to try to move towards some proof of Planet Numbers Club, yeah, I've been having some fun conversations with folks here about that. Um, physics, using this understanding of elliptic and genus 1 vibration structure to better understand heterotic type 2 and F-theory compactification. In other words, knowing that most Calabi Yaos seem to be elliptically fibered and knowing more about the mirror symmetry structure may help us in actually calculating things in a lot of physics models. Um, there's some beautiful work. Um, Albrecht Clem and others have been, have been learning better how to do things like periods when you have an elliptic vibration structure. And now that we see that many things have this elliptic vibration structure, maybe we can write that in, in a way that um, will, will be fairly general. And then I think lots more to do on this mirror symmetry story. We're really just scratching the surface here. I think it should be possible to generalize, the, generalize this factorization beyond toric. Um, that's an interesting discussion, actually, with Anna Foley and dinner last night about how maybe some of the work of Batarev might tie into that. Um, systematically understanding these different fibers and twist structures, connecting with what Paul and collaborators have done, exploring fourfolds further. Um, and then we haven't really systematically looked at the question of what fraction of these two y threes have the factorized mirror symmetry. There's lots of them, but whether it's 50% or 10% or 90%, I, I can't say. Anyway, thanks for your attention. Thanks, everybody, for getting up early. And, um, <laughs>
Can you compute the uh, Yukawa coupling for those serve similar serve mean of effort? That's a great question. I think <coughs> for the mirror fourfold. Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Whether one can compute the Yukawa couplings and say something about it. I don't I, I don't I have to think about that. I, I, I haven't thought about it, but it seems like this factorization of the mirror symmetry structure, in the same way that the F theory language gives us a lot of insight into the structure of the Hodge numbers and the, and the structure for threefolds, maybe it does. I, I, that's a great question. Let me think about that. Get back to you in 35 years. <laughs> Other? Yeah. Um, for like G7 manifold, those fibers can you also do them too? Wait, sorry, say that again? Fiber, G fiber over G7 manifolds, can you do them too? Not just Columbia. Fiber over G7. Like, I'm down on the G7 manifolds, supposed to give you 4D theory. Can you? G2 uh, G2 G2 yeah, G2 manifolds. Yeah, G2 um, manifolds. You know, there is a lot of work recently. Um, Sakura, Schaefer Nimicki, and, and Andreas Brown and others have done things that connect some of this toric language to, and, and some things about Kalabiao's to G2 constructions. Whether there's something that could be said there, I don't know. It's another really good question that goes beyond anything I've thought. A lot of those ones are, in fact, elliptically fibered. Uh, they, they have Do they stay elliptically fibered after you, after you glue? I mean, you're, you're yes. definitely taking two elliptically yes. fibered. Yeah, fi yes. In some cases, they're fibered by elliptic cube. The whole, the whole G2 yes. is. In some cases, there, there's no statistics. Yeah. I know, is there a notion of mirror, is there a notion of mirror symmetry for G2 manifolds? Their recent work focuses on heterotic M theory F theory duality across the elliptic, elliptic K3 fiber G2s. Uh -huh. But, uh, uh, well, Andy's also worked on, on mirror constructions there, but I guess I don't remember enough to comment. Yeah, that's a great question. But well, I, we, I, did, well, we did in the work with Miriam, actually, and uh, Max Miriam, we collected. We did the web mirror, mirror, like like you were saying, mirror heterotic, and 